Um, so first of all, I mean, let me say thank you for inviting me here. Um, it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, and um, I am back because uh, I did my doctorate here um, and I left <laughs> some years ago. <laughs> and but it was in mathematics, um, not philosophy. And um, that was in the days when uh, Lactosh was here. But I, you know, used to go to seminars in the math in the philosophy department on the philosophy of mathematics. Um, and by the time I finished my doctorate, I knew that philosophy was an awful lot more fun than mathematics. And so I decided to be a philosopher, and, and I'm very happy about that. So thank you for having me back. It's slightly strange to be back to my alma mater, something like that, after so many years. Um, but anyway, thank you. So. Um, When I was invited to come and talk to you, I said, what should I talk about? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the reply got was, well, do something of general interest. So I'm not going to give you a technical logic talk. I, I thought I would talk about something that is of general interest. Um, in fact, what I'm going to talk about is of general interest to any thoughtful person nowadays. Because I don't think I need to tell you, you read the newspapers and the scientific reports as well as I do, that we're, the world is on the brink of a looming um, ecological and environmental crisis. Um, and that's something that should concern us all. And I thought I would give you my 10 cents worth on that. But um, I thought I would talk about this from a perspective that you probably haven't met before because uh, my guess is that very few people here know much about East Asian or Asian philosophical traditions. So I'm going to draw on one of those, which is the Buddhist tradition. And um, I'm not going to assume that you know anything about it. So um, one thing I have to do is say something about Buddhist philosophy. And, and let me say straight away that I'm not a Buddhist. <coughs> um, also, Buddhist philosophy is a bit of a misnomer in a certain sense because um, there's no one Buddhist philosophy any more than there's one Christian philosophy. Um, there are many Buddhist philosophers, just so many Christian philosophers. And, and so um, people are going to, even Buddhists are going to disagree about exactly how you view most things. And I'm going to be giving you one perspective, happens to be mine, but other people may disagree with me, and they probably will. So that's why I call this a Buddhist perspective. Um, um, okay, so what we're going to do is this. The talk has two parts, um, and um, the first part is sections one and two, and I need to tell you something about Buddhist ethics and Buddhist metaphysics. And some of this I'm going to go over very fast. I'm going to pause on the things which are going to be really important for the second part of the talk, which is on the environmental issues and the applications of this perspective to, as I said, the looming environmental crisis. So that's where we're going. So um, let's start by talking about Buddhist ethics. So uh, let me give you the idiot's guide to Buddhist ethics. Um, so after he started to teach the Buddha, of course, that wasn't his real name. His name was Siddhartha Gautama. Um, laid down the basics of Buddhist thought in what's called the Four Noble Truths. Don't get hung up about the word noble. It just means worthy of respect. Okay. So there are four clauses, statements, which, um, according to Siddhartha, defined the human condition, as it were. And to paraphrase Gilbert and Sullivan, um, the human lot is not a happy one. <laughs> um, so um, first noble truth, that life is characterized by, and then there's this Sanskrit word, which is very hard to translate into English. The word is dukkha. And the standard translation is suffering. Okay? But that's not a great translation because the word dukkha has so many resonances other than that. So it can mean suffering, pain, discontent, and <laughs> anxiety, dissatisfaction, discomfort, anguish, stress, misery, frustration, in fact, all the things you really love in life, okay? <laughs> now, and 
life, life is like that. Okay. Now, the Buddha wasn't a wowser, and he know he knew that life has moments of happiness and pleasure and uh, fulfillment. So he wasn't say he wouldn't say life is unmiserably shit. Okay, it's not that, but um, everyone. has unhappy experiences recurrently. You're always going to get them. You're always going to get old. If you are lucky enough to live long enough, right? You're going to uh, die eventually. You're going to get sick. You're going to have marriage breakups. You're going to lose, some of you will lose your kids. About a third of the people in this room will get cancer. Okay, you know, life is like that. Um, and even the good things in life come with an edge because when you get something you experience in life, it's often not quite as fulfilling as you want it. I'm sure you probably experienced this. And moreover, um, you're liable to lose it, okay? Marriages break up, people lose their jobs, people um, you know, lose parts of their body because of illness. Um, and so if you're attached to these things, then of course you're going to get unhappy when these things come to pass. Um, so um, the view is not that life is completely miserable. It's not, but it's just that dukkha is a persistent and permanent feature of our life. Now, um, that makes it sound as terribly pessimistic, okay? And sometimes when people meet Buddhism for the first time, they think it's a pessimistic philosophy. It's not. It's realistic for sure, but it's not pessimistic because it says, hey, you can make life better, okay? And that's what the other Four Noble Truths are about. So um, uh, let me come to the other Noble Truths in a moment, but let me just talk about the fact that um, there's an assumption behind the Four Noble Truths that dukkha is not great. And I don't really think that needs much arguing, although we could have a philosophical debate about it in Q&A, but it's assumed that you'd rather live a life without dukkha if you can. Okay. I sometimes think of this as a zeroth Noble Truth. Okay, so let's turn to the other Noble Truths. Um, there's a reason why people experience dukkha. Um, and um, there are three things. Uh, called poisons, clashes, um, which are uh, uh, affect towards the things that happen in life. Namely, we really want the good things to go on. We really want the bad things to go away. So possessiveness and hate. And this one, uh, ignorance or delusion. We do not understand the world in which we live. And I'll come back to that when we talk about the metaphysics. But... Um, the, the main cause of dukkha are the facts that uh, are these things, possessing this hate and ignorance. So those are the causes. Now, third noble truth, get rid of the cause, you get rid of the effect, okay? And you can, at least you can try. Um, so the fourth noble truth is sometimes called the eightfold noble path. And it's a series of steps that you can do to help improve your life. So, um, they come in three groups, um, right view, understand the world you live in, right intention, uh, you've got to want to change for it to happen, um, right action, and these are the things that any Western philosopher would um, recognize as ethical in the usual sense, uh, right action, right speech, right livelihood, and what makes them right is that they uh, do not hurt other people, they're compassionate, they, they help other people, um, and right mental state, right effort. Well, nothing's going to happen unless you put the hard work in. These things are not easy. And they're right mindfulness, right concentration. Um, right mindfulness in particular, be aware of what's happening. Don't just go through life sleepwalking. Okay. So those are the, uh, the eightfold noble path. Now, uh, if I left it at that, you might think, well, that's all fine. But um, that all seems a bit selfish. I mean, the point is to get rid of my dukkha. Uh, what about other people's? I mean, um, indeed, um, 
Buddhism has always been insistent that it's not about simply getting rid of your own dukkha, it's about getting rid of other people's. Um, uh, so a prime virtue is this thing, karuna. Um, and the standard translation for that is compassion. That's not a great translation. Um, a better translation is care. Compassion sounds rather passive, about suffering with, but karuna is about not is about acting in such a way to improve other people's lives. So it's very active. It's not passive at all. Secondly, you can't be compassionate towards yourself. It doesn't really make sense. But you can certainly care for yourself as you care for other people. And for reasons we come to, these often go together. Now let's put it on the table now. Um, how can I care for you if I don't care for myself? If I don't look after myself, if I'm starving, I'm depressed, um, it's not going to work. You have to care for yourself and care for other people. And these things are reciprocal. Okay. Um, let me just say one more thing before we move on. It might seem to you that uh, what I'm suggesting is that in being compassionate to other people, then all you do is worry about their mental state. That's just crazy. OK, because suffering has many causes, OK, and many of them are material. OK, living in a war zone, not being able to have enough to eat, worrying about the health of your kids. All right. These are all causes of um, suffering. And um, Buddhism says, well, you should try and get rid of these as well. Um, why? Because, well, for a start, Doing the things that you need to change your headspace is not easy. You cannot do it if you're in a war zone or worrying about your kids or worrying where your next meal is coming from. It doesn't work. Not only that, the very logic of the situation says that you should get rid of the material causes of suffering as well. Look, suffering is bad, okay? Therefore, you should get rid of it, okay? And uh, it doesn't matter what the causes are. Getting rid of the cause is getting rid of the effect. So if there are material causes of suffering, then you should get rid of those to the extent that it's within your power, if it is. Um, so um, Buddhism, especially in its modern incarnations, um, very much emphasizes the material conditions of the world we live in. And it's no longer a kind of um, a renunciant view where you go and sit in the cushion in your temple and meditate 24 hours a day. Um, so um, why, why should I be interested in getting rid of people's suffering? I mean, why I should be interested in getting rid of my suffering is pretty obvious, right? Why should I be interested in getting rid of yours? Well, the standard replies given by this guy his name is Shantideva. Um, he's writing in about the eighth century of the Common Era. Um, and he's probably the most significant Buddhist ethicist. And he says this, I should prevent the suffering of others because it's suffering like my own suffering. I should also be benevolent to others because they are beings, just as I myself am a being. Since I and others are exactly alike in desiring happiness, what's so special about me that justifies striving after only my own happiness? Since fear and suffering are unwanted by both me and others, what's so special about me that I protect this and not that? In other words, you know, suffering is a bad thing and you should try and get rid of it, okay? Um, look, racism and patriarchy are bad things, right? People suffer because of racism. People suffer because of patriarchy. They're bad and you should get rid of them. And it matters not one iota that I who say this am white and a male. Okay, these things are bad and you should get rid of them, period. Okay, um, so that's the idiot's guide to Buddhist ethics. Now let's turn to metaphysics. Okay, so uh, let me warn again that there's not one single metaphysics. So let me just talk about the little bits that are sort of common to most Buddhisms. Um, <clears throat> Reality has three marks, three features, um, which are no self, 
right? So there's no essential you. That's really important, but it's not on today's agenda. Anita, impermanence. Everything in the causal flux comes into existence when conditions are ripe, persists for a while, and goes out of existence when conditions so determine. Okay, again, that's important, but it's not on today's agenda. This one is particular some other dependent origination. So let's think a little bit about that. Um, Tijis Arpada is sometimes translated as dependent origination or dependent arising. Um, sometimes it's described as the web of interconnectedness. Um, and the thought is that whatever happens, happens as a result of multiple causes, which all come together to bring it about. And that thing, together with other events, conspire to produce a multitude of effects. So, you know, I don't think anyone's going to disagree with that. The problem is that when we think about these things, we don't take the ramifications to heart. So let me just, let's just think about this for a second. So this morning I went to, I got up, I went to Costa's to have a cup of coffee. It was actually bloody awful, but never mind that. Um, just think about getting a cup of coffee in Costas, right? So it was made from beans. Those beans um, ultimately drew their energy from the sun, okay? They grew in Latin America or Africa, and they got their water supply from local rain and streams. They were picked by someone in one of those countries who probably earns a lot less than I do. Um, they were shipped here. Um, probably in a boat owned by yet another country, with sailors from yet another country, and by coal from yet another country. Okay, when it gets to the UK, they're roasted, um, and it's given to the distributors um, who work on a bunch of laws, some of which are international, some of which are British, and so they depend on the functioning of the British Parliament, the EU, well, no longer the EU, but, you know, other legal, international legal bodies. Um, uh, okay, the coffee was served me by some young people um, who were, you know, obviously earning a lot less than I do. All right, um, my purchasing the coffee helped them to sort of go home, uh, have an apartment with a roof over their head when we bring up kids. Um, and um, they will, you know, uh, talk to other people about their day's experiences. Maybe, you know, they'll talk about my chatting to them. Um, Okay, look, this is just the barest outline of my buying coffee in this sort of locus, as a locus of causes and effects. Um, and I recommend it to you as a thought experiment, just to take any one thing that happens to you today, maybe when you're at home tonight, you know, having your glass of scotch or, you know, you, yeah, poker or whatever you have. Just think about one thing that happened today and think about everything that was involved in making that one thing possible and the possible ramifications of what you did and what other people did and so on. Um, and when you do that, you will realize that you are deeply integrated with people, not just in London, not just in Britain, all over the world. Okay, as you turn on your TV, then you are dependent on the people who you know, put global satellites around the world. When you use your phone, you're dependent on the people who made them. Okay, so the web of interconnections is pervasive. Probably it connects you to nearly everybody else, past, present, and future. Okay. So this is important because when you're thinking about ethical treatment, it means you cannot just take into account how you treat your next door neighbor or your professor or your students or whatever. You've got to think about all the people who make your life possible. Okay, um, so this is Jay Garfield. To cultivate care, that's Karuna, is to recognize both the omnipresence of suffering 
and our interconnectedness through the web of dependent origination. It's recognized that one cannot solve even the problems of one's own suffering without caring for that of others as well, given our essentially social nature and the claims that nature ensures will make upon one another. Uh, okay. Um, again, before we get on to the second part, though, let me just sort of hammer this point home because I think people do not sufficiently appreciate it. You and I are essentially social creatures. And if we have more time, I talk about Marx in this regard, but Buddhism is enough for one day. <laughs> so you cannot, you could not, I mean, the life you live will be impossible without all the people, not just the ones that give you your coffee. Okay. Um, you depend on the British taxpayers who pay your stipend or your salary. You depend on the people who make your iPhone. You depend on the people who, you know, ship goods from China for you to buy. You depend on the people who design your clothes. You depend on, okay, th this web of interconnection it goes everywhere. And um, your well being depends on their well being. If the people who, you know, pay your salary can't get the money from the taxpayer, you lose your job, okay? If the people um, who you know, decide to put the satellites around the earth decided they weren't going to maintain them anymore, you lose your cell phone and lots of and your bank account, lots of other things. Um, your flourishing depends upon the flourishing of a lot of other people. In fact, nearly everybody, given the breadth of the, the um, and depth of Pratija Summit Pada. Um, but of course, uh, you know, this is a two way street. I mean, um, in a sense, the, 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 the well being of the people who I come in contact with um, uh, depends also on me. If I'm an asshole to my students, they're going to suffer. If um, I'm a bad colleague to my colleagues, they're going to suffer too. So, you know, these things. Um, Compassionate action is, um, let me put it around the other way. If you think about standard accounts of ethics, um, it's normally thought of as a zero sum game. You know, my rights are your duties. When I sell something, my profit is your loss, et cetera, et cetera. Buddhist ethics says, no, that's the wrong perspective on things. Um, ethical action is a win-win situation. I help you to flourish. You help me to flourish, and we all flourish together. Okay. All right. So um, that's the end of the first part of the talk. Let me just pause there for a second, because I want to move on now to environmental issues. Um, but just in case there are any points of classification, sorry, clarification, let me just see if anyone wants to raise anything about what I've just said. And to be clear, we will have a plenty of time for Q&A at, at the end as well. So this is a good opportunity if you just want anything clarified quickly. But there'll be time later as well. Yeah. Can you just elaborate on a lot of those points you made about uh, Western tradition of ethics treating the interaction as a zero stop game? I'm not sure which one. Um, yeah. um, Look, Western ethics, at least um, post 17th, 18th century, depends very much on um, social atomism. So if you look at um, the social compact as discussed by Hobbes and Locke and so on, it tells a story that people are essentially um, individual by their nature, they're free formed with respect to um, their interests, their rights, and so on. Um, but uh, the, if they don't cooperate, there'll be a war of all against all. They won't last long, Hobbes, of course. So what they do is they come together in the social compact takes to have some of the some of their aspects of their life enforced by central government, um, so they can protect their own interests. But nonetheless, within that social compact, I pursue my own interests. That's what the compact is for for me to pursue pursue my interests. So. Um, uh, I want to make as much money as possible because that's good. Okay. It's not surprising that this view came into being when capitalism was hitting its strides. 
Um, and uh, it's fine for me to uh, exploit you in any way I like, because that's in my interest. And if I can make a lot of money by exploiting you, that's all, that's all moral, okay? So as I say, my gain might be your loss, but that's all fine. Um, so morality then is about this kind of trade-off between individuals, each of whom looks after their own interests to the detriment of other people. That's what the social contract is all about. So that's what I had in mind, okay? Um, we can certainly discuss this later, but that's what I had in mind. Any other general questions? Yeah. Uh, if everyone cares about others, can the world really be broken? Why not? Mm. Like I mean, the effect of feeling of priorities or uh, can be achieved by everyone care for others. It could look. I don't think we're going to design a perfect society. But sure as hell, it could be better than the society we live in now. Leave the environment aside. A third of the world's population maybe more, do not have adequate food, they do not have adequate medical care, even in the United States, which is one of the richest countries in the world, okay? If we can't design a better society than this or work towards a better society than this, there's something really sad. You know, people are smart beings. If they understand the situation they're in, understand what makes them flourish, understand what doesn't make them flourish, they must be able to do better than this, okay? We can certainly talk about that later. But um, we've been changing the world and our society for 2,000 years. Do you think that change has come to an end? Obviously not. Whatever world we're living in in the year 3,000 will be nothing like the world we're living in in the year 2,000 any more than the world in 2,000 is the world is similar to the world in 1,000. The world is going to change. That's almost obvious, okay? The question is not how we change it. The question is how do we change it for the better? Okay. We can come back to some of these issues in due course, but let's get on to environmental issues. Um, okay, I'm going to skip over that because of time. Um, okay, let me talk about the looming ecological crisis. And um, if I was in the United States, I would expect to get still some climate deniers. I assume I'm not so likely to get this in the UK, but maybe there are climate deniers in the audience. We can discuss that. Um, but by and large, I assume I'm preaching to the choir here. But what I want to do is tell you how some of the things I said about Buddhist ethics and metaphysics bear on the current ecological situation. Many of those will be pretty obvious to you now. I mean, so um, let's talk about this. Look, um, there is nothing wrong with changing the environment. We have been doing this now as long as there have been humans. And some of those things have been good, okay? We have um, made sure that people, or some people at least, have food security, which used not to be the case. Um, we have developed medical technologies which help people when they're ill. Uh, we have eradicated many terrible sicknesses. Although I know that smallpox is making a comeback, um, but polio has been largely eradicated. Um, so, I mean, all these involve environmental changes, okay? Um, so we've been changing the environment and some of those changes are for the better. No doubt about that. Why? Well, because they reduce suffering. Um, but since the Industrial Revolution, we've been increasing the temperature of the planet with consequences that we've only come to realize in the last 30 years due to our understanding of the interconnectedness of elements of the environment. So Pratik Samapada is a very old view, but the modern ecological understanding of how the bits of our environment relate to each other is relatively new because of climate science, okay? 
but climate science is just an example of an understanding of predictive sum up pattern. Um, okay, so um, the increasing global temperature is, I don't think, arguable now. Already, we have seen an increase of um, freak weather conditions like floods, tornadoes, droughts. Um, sea levels are already beginning to rise and they're gonna wipe out a lot of Pacific islands. Even the southern half of Manhattan, which is below sea level, is threatened, okay? So these things are now starting to happen already, okay? Um, because of the changes that we're making to the climate, um, things are getting rather desperate in many places, especially in those places where people have done least to affect climate change, which are the sort of global South countries. Okay, so what we're seeing are rising sea levels, extreme weather conditions, fires, drought outs, floods, um, disruption of arable lands. Just think how much of the arable land is near the coasts in most countries. Um, destruction of various ecosystems on which we defend, depend, okay? Think what we're doing to the oceans, for example, by climate change. Um, and in the end, you know, your life and my life depends on plankton because they're at the bottom of the food chain. Um, okay, the effects, well, um, shortages of food and clean water are likely. Only about four days ago, the head of the United Nations said, unless we get our act together real fast, we are going to be facing a crisis about clean water by 2030. You take it for granted, you turn on your tap and it comes out. You cannot take it for granted, especially if you live in the global south, which may not even, you may not even have a tap. Okay, migration. Um, look, the people who live on the coastal areas, they're gonna stay there because their home's gonna be underwater. They're gonna move. Now, we've already seen what migration does when people migrate. I read the news about people coming from North Africa to Europe every day. You know how politically disruptive this is, okay? It's gonna happen more and more in the next 15, 20 years. Um, increasing competition for resources, prime resources and markets. Well, that's pretty obvious. If resources are dwindling, competition volume increases. Um, increased international conflicts and war because nations protect their economies. You don't need to know much about the United States or China to know they go through this and they compete with each other for it. So if there's increasing economic um, problems, it's going to increase conflict. And um, a lot of that is clearly going to cause a North Island of Dukan. So, given the first half of this talk, we should work to get rid of it. To, to, if we can't ensure that we're gonna go back to you know, pre-industrial levels of climate, we can at least try and make what happens at least compassionate for everybody living in the world, especially those who are gonna suffer most. Um, okay, there's, there's an ostrich reaction, which I'm sure that a lot of people in the first world had, especially, in the United States, namely that um, you think you could hunker down and avoid all this. You know, the United States is a very rich country. Some people are very, very rich. And they think, well, if they can do what they like. Other people don't screw themselves uh, because I'm all right, Jack. Okay, um, obviously that's unethical, but it's also false because if you think about it, even the rich, are connected by the web of Pratichya Samad Pada to what goes on in the world. When migration happens in a country, it affects everybody, right? Maybe by causing social disruption, look what's happening in the United States at the moment, look what happens in um, Europe now with the people who come from North America. Um, and uh, if economic conditions are disrupted, then that affects everybody. If clean water is a problem, it's gonna be a problem for everybody. Um, so the world is, people in the world are not just connected um, socially, they're connected uh, economically as well. So everyone 
is going to be affected by mass migration, economic shortages, new global diseases caused by new environmental conditions. I don't think I need to hammer that after three years of COVID. Um, increased international competition, maybe military. How far away are we from military confrontation between China and America? Uncomfortably close, I think. Um, all right, so first noble truth um, or the first part of the fourth noble truth, right view, understand the world you're living in. If you don't understand it, you won't do anything about it or at least won't do anything efficacious, right? So all I've done is describe the world to you as I think science and any thoughtful person now sees it. So what can be done? Okay, obviously important. Um, well, okay, here's a utopian solution. Um, we institute a world body that can put in place and enforce appropriate coordinated international activity. Yeah, right. Um, we can redistribute the world's resources more evenly across its peoples. We can have or probably decrease the size of the world's population. If there were 4 billion of us, not 8 billion of us, we wouldn't be in this situation. Uh, we could put a halt to a fall of economic production whose rationale is growth, which is causing a lot of the problem. Yes, I'm talking about capitalism. Okay. Um, but this would require a level of international cooperation, which is frankly utopian. It ain't gonna happen. We haven't done it in the last 30 years, even though the writing was on the wall, we ain't gonna do it in the next 30 years. So nice as though that might be, it ain't gonna happen. So what we can do? Well, we can do some things. Um, they might not stop global warming, but they can at least make sure it doesn't get as bad as it might. So um, we can underwrite the R&D of cleaner technologies, for example, by taxing the production and use of fossil fuels and using the tax to subsidize development of renewable energy. Um, and of course, sharing the results with countries of the global south. So if you listen to governments now, they'll say, oh, well, we'll underwrite new technologies because it'll make us more affluent. What about the people who are really suffering in the global south? Well, the new technologies developed should be helping them as well because they are suffering as much as probably more than people in the global north. Um, winding back coal and oil productions and setting strict emission limits on cars, power plants, power plants, <laughs> other heavy polluters, all of which concern are all of this with concern for those who will have to move to different jobs. Okay, so we're we're changing the economy. Some old traditional um, industries are going to go. Hopefully, you know, gas plants, um, power plants, um, people are going to lose their jobs. So, you know, losing your job is definitely a form of suffering. So that when we change the economy, we should think about all the people who are going to lose their jobs and their wives and husbands and kids. Expanding public transportation and diminishing the reliance on private motor vehicles and air travel. Okay, I flew here from New York yesterday, so there's a, an element of kind of self-criticism here. But you're happy to have me here, that's all right. So. Okay, so um, what else could we do? Um, well, uh, there is more. Uh, we could uh, implement sustainable food production and forestry and encourage people to move away from a meat-consuming diet, which is energy inefficient and environmentally destructive. Think of the Amazon, okay? But it ain't just the Amazon. Um, meat production is amazingly inefficient in terms of nutrition. Okay? Take something like eight kilograms of vegetable, usable, humanly usable vegetable protein to uh, produce one kilo of humanly usable animal protein. Right? Um, encouraging measures to stop population growth, education, family planning. Um, we know that if you educate women then uh, and enable them to use family planning services, then the um, size of families goes down, okay? So um, there are easy things we can do to at least stop the world population getting too much larger, namely educate people 
especially women, to have control of their own fertility. Um, uh, okay, so those are some of the things we can do. But um, they're at best going to slow down the change or cap it. Um, things are going to get worse. Okay, so we've got to prepare for what is not going to be, you know, a happy place over the next 20, 30 years. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we educate people. If they don't understand the situation, then um, they're not going to act appropriately. So education is crucial. We should be preparing to accommodate mass migration because it's going to happen. And we know that simply putting up a fence to keep people out does not work. Witness the wall at the Mexican border with the United States. Um, we must be prepared to deal with extreme weather conditions of the kind that we've seen a lot of. Tornadoes, floods, fires. Even in the UK, you've had some rather inclement weather recently, I believe. Okay. Uh, like the coldest uh, March, February day on written memory. Um, moving to sustainable energy and food systems and systems which work under conditions of increased stress because the climate change is going to <laughs> induce a lot of increased stress on our production of food and water, clean water. Um, and probably the most important of all, is developing an economic system which is more humane and more rational than the one we have. And yes, I'm talking about getting rid of capitalism. Okay, but that is a whole new discussion, but a very important one. Okay, so let me finish. <laughs> it's kind of hard to know how to finish a talk like this. Now I've scared, scared the bejesus out of all of you. So what do I do? Um, I thought I'd end with some poetry. Okay. Most of you, well, before I give you the poetry, let me just summarize the, what I've said to scare the bejesus out of you some more. Okay. Um, what we do, we need to understand the Buddhist lessons of care and interconnectedness, because that's what's been driving what I've said about what we should do in response to the ecological crisis, okay? Compassion to other people is important. Understanding the interconnectedness of people and things is important. Because we live in a world of global, ecological, and other interconnections, uh, where we flourish collectively or not at all. Okay, here's the poetry, okay. John Dunn, some of you will of course know this. Um, no man is an island, entire itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a clod be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I'm involved in mankind. And therefore, never send a no for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. <laughs>